New Zealand, paradise on earth. It's an honest land of fresh air, white beaches, and clean living. But New Zealand is also home to some of the world's most intimidating gangs. It is some of these gang members who are meeting me in Wellington, the country's capital. I've heard terrifying stories of mayhem, depravity, and almost inhuman violence. It's difficult to imagine anything like that, like this. My name is Ross Kemp. I've come to find out whether the stories I've heard are myth or grim reality. I've got an in with the country's most feared gang, the mongrel mob. For me, this is truly a journey into the unknown. An ordinary high street in an ordinary town in the middle of the day. Mongrel mob in red against their arch foe, the Black Power. The weapons, hammers, sticks and golf clubs. This was not a one-off. It was part of a feud that goes back decades. Another time, another place, but the same two gangs, the middle of a city, in the middle of the day. There was probably, oh, probably a thousand people around the whole square. Lunchtime, um, people sitting down enjoying the sun and the music. And then suddenly, um, from out of nowhere, uh, a fight erupted just over here. It was a fight between two gangs, the uh, Christchurch uh, Mongrel Mob and the Black Power. It was a planned attack. Two or three members of the mongrel mob were surrounded by about a dozen Black Power members. The leader of the Black Power gang signalled the start of the attack by holding his two fingers above his head and bringing his fingers down, and then it was all off. Out came knives, a piece of water pipe, chains. One of them got stabbed with a knife. On his side, he had a shoulder bag. From that, he produced an axe. His mate then picked up the axe, grabbed one of the opposing gang members, and struck him a blow just behind the neck. The axe went through his jacket, two thicknesses, through his jersey and a T-shirt, and just nicked the side of his neck. Miraculously, uh, he escaped fatal injuries. So brazen was the violence that many bystanders believed to be some sort of radical street theatre. Not that the presence of witnesses ever bothered this lot. So they don't really care, do they? Well, no. Um, An axe in the middle of daylight yeah, in yeah. front of yeah. a thousand people. Yeah. They have no fear. They don't operate on the same fear that, that we would have of witnesses seeing something or someone taking car numbers or whatever in that. Hey, who cares? Spontaneous violence will take over and that person will get a stomping or kicking or could well end up being stabbed or beaten to death in front of other witnesses. The presence of witnesses that usually deters people doesn't, doesn't even come into the equation here. To try and find out more, I've come to Porirua, a town the mongrel mob considers their turf. There's a musical festival on and the mongrel mob are out in force. There's no black power here, nor any other gang, but it wasn't always like that. When you, when you were young, growing up here, there it wasn't just one gang, there were 11 gangs here, wasn't there? Oh yeah, there was about 11 gangs, but as you see today, there's only one gang here. Only place in the whole of New Zealand no other gang will come to. And why is that? Well, because you run it. <laughs> you run it, you cleaned it up. 
My guide on this journey into the dangerous world of the mongrel mob is longtime member Dennis Macalio. So if, if there were other gangs in here, there would, there would be trouble, yeah? Oh, I wouldn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hell yeah. But they, they would, no other gang would come in. Really? What would happen to them if they were seen here? Oh, well, we both know what would happen. <laughs> right. Okay. Fair enough. How did you come to get into the mob? When I was a little kid at primary, there was these, these two, two, two big fucking ugly motherfuckers that used to walk around Poirot and they were the most fucking meanest and ugliest fucking things on earth and, and then I thought, fuck, that's me, man. I wanted to be like that and then I've never looked back since. When Dennis Macalio made a reality of his childhood dream, he became every cop's nightmare. He was the archetypal mobster, a single man with no commitments. One night in the 80s, two unfortunate cops wandered into the middle of a mob meeting. These two fucking, <laughs> these two pigs walked in like fucking Starsky and Hutchin. Yeah, swinging their fucking bats like this and they came into the fucking pad and, you know, I had no fucking commitments. I just fucking went behind them and I shut the fucking door and turned the lights out. Yeah. And they fucking got it. They See, how long did you hold them for? Oh, fuck. I mean, this only happened for a matter of fucking 15 minutes. I think, um... You used to them for torture, though, weren't you? Well, well, I look at it this way, you know, like, um, you know, we're talking, I was burning them, fucking every fucking thing. I mean, I, I, got, I got a leg for it. That's why I can fucking talk about it. I, I got found guilty. Other mongrels got found guilty from, from just fucking watching it. I'm not a fucking shame to say that. Mm. And the problem with mongrel mob, they, they, they want to close up. I, I'm not going to fucking close up no more. I'm, 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 I'm proud to be a fucking mongi. I'm proud to talk about the fucking mongrel mob. I don't talk about fucking uh, other people. I, I fucking talk about me, what I do. A mark of Dennis's commitment to the mongrel mob is his facial tattoos, or mask. To me, it's my belief. I can't run away. It's there forever, you know? Whatever town I go into, whatever I do, people know that I represent the mongrel mob. It's like giving away your life, isn't it, really? Well, it's an identity, yeah. And saying for the rest of your life, you'll be associated to the mob. With the mob, mob. You know, there's no turning back. The mongrel mob is a national phenomenon. It is organised as a loose affiliation of independent chapters. And it has a presence in most of New Zealand's major towns and cities. Among them is this place, Napier on the east coast of the North Island. This town played a key part in the early history of the mob. The gang began in the 1960s as a group of disaffected youths from welfare homes and borstals. They claimed they'd suffered brutal treatment at the hands of the authorities. For Gary Gerbis, what followed was revenge. We had no fear of the system, despise the system for the treatment we got as social welfare kids, man. You know, that was bred into us at 13 year old kids. Mm. As a, at the abuse and the treatment we got from people who were supposed to be our helpers, the welfare, huh? Man, they shit on us, man. So. We decided to ship back. We shipped back. We made them stand up and take notice. The mongrel mob adopted the swastika as a symbol of their rebellion. They turned their backs on many of the values of mainstream New Zealand, establishing a brutal and sometimes savage alternative. Their pads or clubhouses, like this one I'm visiting in Hastings, became no-go areas for outsiders. And any woman who ventured inside was required to know her place. We are members of the mongrel mob. We fuck for thousands. Seagull suck too much. 
Yeah, last year then we put him on the block, let them take the satisfaction of a mongoose cock seek. People talk about the block. What was that? A block he asks is a chick. She knows what the fucking story is if she's going to come knocking on the door. Into the clubhouse? Yeah. And she knows if she's coming in there to feed us. Top zoom the fucking position. And this sort of behaviour wasn't restricted to the privacy of the clubhouse. In a Napier bar one evening, Gary Gerbis became irritated by the way a girl of his acquaintance was making fun of his mate. She was sitting on a bar stool. He grabbed her with one leg, foot, ankle. I grabbed with that one. We just hoisted her up in the fucking air. The breast fell down around her head. And we tipped her up on the bow like that, and I ripped that fucking pants out of my teeth. Um, and again, like I said, we did things to to shock, shock people. She had a she had a period, and then days I was crazy. I didn't think I'd do anything. You see? So I, I ripped that pants off of my teeth and I. I pulled her tampon out of her by my teeth. And I was slapping around my face and my young mate Dougie was licking all the blood off my face, you know. It was quite rough, eh? <laughs> we're, quite, we're, we're pretty rough people, mm -hmm. you know. It was, was mind-blowing shit. And, uh, we ate it. You ate it? <laughs> we ate it. <laughs> so, so um, ate you it. and your mate, you both ate the tampon. Yeah. And what happened next? A couple of people had a thing about it and, and, and moaned about it, so I, I, I fucking knocked them down, burst them up, give them hiding. Um, I made love to her on the bar, screwing in front of everybody. Yeah, um, how was she about that? Mate, she enjoyed it. Yeah. But, um, did she go away after that or did she hang around? Oh, no, she loved it. No, she hung and she was in love with me. Yeah? Uh, I mean, again, in these days, I felt the little woman were into aggressive, hard men. I find it impossible to believe that any woman would want to be treated like this. But a female's position within the gang has always been subservient. I mean, they love a dog. They yeah, fan they... clubs. You told me you have fan clubs. Yeah, oh, we got fan clubs. Explain a fan club to me. A fan club is just a whole lot, it's just a whole lot of bitches that 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 look after look after a soldier, look after a brother, w w without you know him getting into any fucking shit. So what they protect them? Well, they 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 fuck them. Fucking knife. Yeah. Back at the pad, we are treated to a mob salute and bark. Oh rah! Oh rah! Oh rah! The name of the gang came courtesy of a local judge. Outraged at the way some of Gary Gerbis' mates were behaving, he condemned them as a bunch of mongrels. The label stuck. You want to call us mongrels? Mongrels are dogs, we'll be it. What does that stand for to you? What does it mean? It means a bunch of guys that, 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 that are friends, regardless of what. What you've been through, where you've been. You've had hard times with each other, you've had good times with each other, but a friend's a friend. For Dennis Macalio, this loyalty stretches beyond the grave. He takes photographs of the headstones of those who have died. For him, the tombs of fallen brothers have become places of pilgrimage. What I'd learned about the mongrel mob so far was pretty shocking. But as I was to find out, the cost of being a mob member could also be high. On the road in New Zealand with longtime gang member Dennis Macalio. He's my guide into the normally closed world of the mongrel mob. Because of their reckless lifestyle, members of the mob do not often make old bones. Drink, car crashes, even police shootings have taken their toll. But only one man was beaten to death 
by a rugby league team. Lester Epps is buried here. It took a whole rugby team to kill this fella. And they had to kill him. He was asleep in um, that side of the pad. He just finished coming back from that pub that night and uh, giving quite a few of them a, a good crack. So he'd been to the pub, beating a few of these rugby league guys up. Yeah, and then uh, they'd come around and they got him about five, six o'clock in the morning, just breaking daylight. A dispute between Epps' chapter and a local yes, rugby, rugby league club sleep. ended with him being dragged out of the van he was sleeping in and so badly beaten that he died in hospital three days later. He was on life um, machine for about three days. Right. So they just, they just use fists and, and boots, yeah? Or? Well, everything. But it was a sad death, I mean. He had his two little kids here and they had a big flag over here. And... I mean, this, this whole fucking area was just covered in patches. Mongol mob from all over New Zealand. Can pay respect. Can pay their respects for this fellow. Because he's a legend, yeah? Oh. Well, they all got 18 months, man. Somebody like Lester Epps will always be remembered by the mob. But Dennis fears that many others are being forgotten, and they are the mob's history. And if you don't know where you've been, how can you possibly know where you are going? I've just had so many friends that have passed away that have been in the mob, you know, and um, they keep me strong. So the whole idea is to stick to the fucking code. Yeah, what is the code? What is the code to you? To me, everything's all about honour, loyalty and respect. I mean, that's what it is at the end of the day. It all, it all still boils down to honour, loyalty and respect. But honour, loyalty and respect are values we would all espouse. What distinguishes the mob is the violence. The roots of this are buried deep. <laughs> Maori culture is a war culture. For centuries, New Zealand's rival tribes fought each other for land and honour. And until the Treaty of Waitangi brought the tribes into partnership with the Crown in the 19th century, they had fought the white man too. I'm at a Maori meeting house, or marae, with Johnny Nepe Apatu. An incantation to... Two Matawinga, God of War. God of War. Yeah, so to lift up the spirit. To give them their mana or their, their strength. The strength, the mana. To, to come out here to challenge you. So it's like a prayer to the gods? Or yeah, it's an incantation. This is a welcome Maori style. Though rooted in the violence of war, Maori culture has a protocol of challenge and respect, rules of engagement, which bring order to this violence. As warriors, the Maori are without equal. They were among the first New Zealanders to volunteer to fight the Nazis during the Second World War. The Maori Battalion is a Kiwi legend. They were fantastic soldiers, fierce, loyal, selfless, and very brave. It is reckoned that five in every seven of its members were either injured or killed. And with the 15 striking positions, there are 15 defences. Johnny Nepi Apatu is a master of the Maori martial art of Motaiaha. So your ancestors would have felt that, bro? Yeah, big time. Right? But uh, they gave us something else to bloody catch hold of, and that was the gun. Yeah. So we're now developing into using the gun. <laughs> 
but we maintain this. All right? Johnny's the only member of the mongrel mob in the room, but he sees a direct line between the martial traditions of the Maori people and the life of the mob. So you want to know why, why we're the way we are? This is what our chiefman have brought us up on. Mm. So if you want to know what Mongolism's about, we know how to fight. But in the 60s, young Maoris abandoned the marae with its rules and headed for the city. There, the gangs became the focus for these old fighting instincts. When they killed their own, mainstream New Zealand tended to shrug its shoulders. But every now and then, civilians get sucked in. First light on a wet autumn morning just outside Napier. My journey into the sometimes profane world of the mongrel mob has brought me to a bleak river crossing. It is not a place that would have featured in 16-year-old Colleen Burra's plans when early one evening in 1987, she went to get a takeaway with her family. Colleen asked me if she could go with him. I didn't see any harm in doing so, so um, they rung them a taxi, a shuttle, and they all went off into town. The trip to the chippy should have taken no more than an hour. I was concerned because it taken hours to come home. I continued to wait till about, oh, half past 12, past midnight, and I thought, oh, this is so unusual. It's not like her to stay out at night. She doesn't go out at night. The Tutukuri River creeps through this featureless valley outside Napier on its way to the Pacific Ocean. Early that morning, a man out running made a grim discovery near the river's edge. The body of a young woman. She was naked and she'd had severe head injuries and severe bruising, cuts and lacerations to the rest of her body. Initially, the, the focus of the investigation was to identify that person. The truth was revealed by some distinctive tattoos. The body was that of 16-year-old Colleen. She and her family, it turned out, had not visited the takeaway. Instead, they had gone to a hotel bar in Napier where they had all started drinking. And they lost track of her. During the period of time, they were inside the hotel. And by the time it was time for them to return, they assumed that she had gone with somebody else, another member of the family, so everyone would never really knew where she was. We established that she'd been picked up at some stage by members of the mongrel mob and their associates and had ended up at a party in Tamatea, which is a Napier suburb. Just days after Colleen's murder, Jeff Gunn was interviewing Napier mongrel mob member Sam Tahai. He would be one of the most violent offenders that I'd confronted um, my time in the police. For a while, Tahai and his accomplice, Tad Sullivan, denied everything. Finally, they admitted that, yes, they had taken her from the party uh, down to the riverbank. They'd taken her down the riverbank, obviously, for sex. She never gave in to the... Um, demands, um, so they, they um, brutally booted her with their steel cap boots. Kicked her body. And left her lying there. Drove off in the vehicle as they were driving off, noticed that she was still moving, um, turned the vehicle around some distance from her at that stage and then drove back towards her. They ran her over, I don't know how many times. Um, and left her there, lying there.
Even 18 years after Colleen met her brutal death, Jeff Gunn remembers Sam Tahai's matter-of-fact manner. When he finally did admit to his involvement, he could have been admitting to stealing a car or um, doing a burglary. Just no, no remorse at all. Sort of shrug of the shoulders and, and that was it. It may not have touched Sam to high, but Ida's desperate story certainly got to me. The mob would tell you that hideous crimes like this are a thing of the past, that they are changing. Rape and the block are pretty much gone, they say. But the nihilism at their heart surely limits the potential for reform. This is Auckland Prison, one of the toughest in New Zealand. Gang members make up around 11% of New Zealand's jail population. One of the problems in dealing with the mob and its crimes is that prison has not been a deterrent. But can it be true, as Dennis insists, that the mob actually runs the jails? Feels very much like an American prison. Auckland Prison was designed on American design. No matter where you are inside the prison, you get a very good visual uh, view of corridors and cell block areas. Let's go in. The gang hierarchies and some of the violence seen on the outside are replicated inside prison. For site manager Brian Christie, the gangs are a constant concern. Brian, how gang aware do you have to be running a place like this? You have to be aware of your mixtures of different gangs and um, ensure that you don't have a build-up of the more troublesome, disruptive elements in one particular area. So how do you go about keeping the peace between the gangs? Sometimes it's very good value to have equal numbers of each gang together. And it's also a good need to have your staff moving in and out of the inmates to get a gauge of the a feel of the actual, the actual unit. So you have Black Power and Mongrel Mob on the same wing? Yes, they're in the same unit, yes. It's bizarre to think forcing two warring gangs together is the best way to keep the peace. Then again, have your enemy as your neighbour, and maybe you have to start getting along. A lot of people said to us that the prisons are run by the mongrel mob. Is there any kind of truth in that at all? I don't think, and I don't believe, that the, they actually run the prison. We, we monitor their activities and see how things go. Now, if it starts looking like um, the mongrel mob is starting to tool, tool themselves up, we'll close the place down and do a pretty thorough search. If there's a need to separate individuals, we'll certainly do that. Having a big war, a scrap, a gang war, does not phase these guys. Does not phase them. <clears throat> just part and parcel. It's just part of their lifestyle. They hate each other with a vengeance, sure, and, and there have been occasions where we've had um, brothers in different gangs. Really? Yes, we've had brothers from different gangs in this place, and um, they have to fight against one another. And that, that is a sad thing. Um, and a lot of people can't understand that, but that's the way they are. That's how strong the code is. So the code runs deep? It runs very deep. Wairoa in Hawke's Bay. Safe, friendly and clean. A modest little community going quietly about its business. New Zealand as I'd always imagined it. But for years, Wairoa has fought to shake off a reputation for serious gang violence. In Dennis's hometown, the mongrel mob is the only gang. It brings a sort of stability. Wairoa is different. Here, there is a volatility born out of the fact that the mongrel mob has a rival, the black power. They've been at each other's throats 
for 30 years. They're on opposite side of the river and, and they claim what they call their territory. And, and most of it is a fight over territory. One gang will go over and zoom around in a car and make a few obscene gestures and, and start a bit of a fight. And generally that's minor stuff. Unfortunately, at times it flares up into really serious stuff and the gun is produced. Not very often, but it had happened a couple of times. The latest serious episode was in November 2002. The two gangs clashed outside the town's tiny courthouse in the middle of the day. The fighting spilled out onto the town's main street. When it ended here, on the other side of the river near the mob's HQ, one Black Power member lay shot dead. Nobody knows more about Wairoa's gang problems than Sergeant Chris Flood. He has been a police officer in the town for more than a quarter of a century. Wairoa's a very small community. It's a beautiful community, and when these instances involving the gangs, perhaps a shooting and that, um, the expectation is that it would happen in a, in, in a city. And yes, it does happen in the cities. Unfortunately for us, we have had instances where there has been shootings here. As to why that happens, if we knew the reason why, we might be able to stop it. The Hawke's Bay town of Wairoa is calling for urgent government action over the problem of gangs. Wairoa has been plagued by feuding gangs for years, and it was the scene of a... So how do you explain what's happened to this pleasant little town? A Black Power member wounded in the shootout has been moved to a hospital outside the district because authorities fear for his safety. Police say Wairoa has been suffering gang problems all year. Wairoa is working hard to end its gang problem. Last night, shots were fired, Molotov cocktails were thrown, and afterwards one man lay dead and two were injured. It's hard for the town to confront the mob head on. Wairoa's gang members are tiny in number, but Maori culture places great emphasis on the extended family. And this minority is related to the majority of the town. The town has to stop its young people joining. Nobody wants to see a repeat of what happened to this man. The call to the new Wairoa Hotel in the 80s is something that Chris Flood will never forget. We were told that somebody could have been stabbed. We arrived there and, sure enough, in the toilets of the hotel, there was a guy stabbed. And he'd been stabbed in the stomach, and the stomach had been opened right up. Mahi Kaimona had been involved in a dispute with a member of the mongrel mob over the way that the gang had treated some girls. Mahi had punched the gang member and knocked him out. This was revenge, mob style. When we got there and when we saw him, it was more than the stabbing. You know, this, this guy had been almost disemboweled. I can remember as it was like, it happened just two minutes ago. Satipus turn around, pulling up your zip, opening up the door to walk out. And as you're opening up that door, the knives are going straight into your guts. Because all you're seeing is trying to pull your zip up, you see your blade go straight in and come out. The intestines were, were, were coming out and we, we just sort of held them there. Um, um, it didn't seem right that they should be, you know, we didn't want them to come out and go on the floor or anything like that. And uh, we just, um, I think they got bar towels from memory. I might be wrong there, but, uh, you know, I, I remember we had some form of cloth that we could just put over that was trying to keep it as clean as possible and, and, uh, and look after him. Just a few cats. Well, that's about it. There's no muscles in there to um, keep it there, keep your stomach there. I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing, that somebody could do something like that to somebody else. The mongrel mob is clearly capable of anything. One thing they don't often do, however, is talk to people like me. These are difficult times for the Wairoa chapter. The trial for the courthouse killing 
is on the horizon. Three Warora members have been charged with murder. The mob are keeping their heads down. Nevertheless, Dennis has convinced a few of the chapter to meet me. Until the 1990s, the mongrel mob's pad was close to Wairoa's town centre. This brought mob members into daily contact with ordinary townsfolk. The council forced the gang out, but allowed them to take over an old factory here on the outskirts. They don't get into town much these days. They are banned from Wairoa's bars and hotels. This is now their home. And they sort of forced us to live the lifestyle we live. You know, we, we don't want to go by theirs. Their system is failing already, you can see it. The government system's failing, so we, we, we go by our own ways. We, we do our own thing, you know. They forced it on us. far enough. Force control. Uh, and it's growing all the time as well, isn't it? Yeah, well, you know. It's not going to die out. You say it's, cha it's changing. Can you give me an example of how you think it's changed? Well, uh, we've tried to change, eh? Like, uh, try to keep out of jail jobs, eh? Get a few of our members into jobs and that. Mm. <laughs> but, um, but one thing remains constant in the world of the mongrel mob, the need to force a reaction. The, the way that you adopt the Zeeks, the swastika mm -hmm. and the imagery is basically out to say fuck off to everybody else that isn't in the mob, is that basically it? Pissing society off, you know? Is they don't want to see them. But here we are, and no one's going to change it. Um, the country hated Nazism, you know, Mary Battalion and everything. That was picked up and used to piss society off, so to use Hitler's... Um, symbol. Saying some... I mean, even even the use of putting a German helmet on top of a fucking British bulldog, well, that's a fucking insult. And you know, anything to do with insults would work. And, and you keep up the same way of doing things, yeah? It's kind of like a ritual. It's kind of part of, part of the code of being in the mob, isn't it? We show respect to people who we know that deserve respect. Uh, otherwise, you know, we don't want to know you. You're there, there, bro. The world is changing for the mongrel mob. The huge street battles of the 70s and 80s are a thing of the past. This may be just that the mob is getting older. Or is it, as some of the police believe, about drugs? When you're involved in that sort of business, the type of police attention generated by a mass brawl is the very last thing you need. A mongrel mob into drugs would be bad news for New Zealand but it could also have the potential to destroy the mob from within. The main flavor in the old days was piss, okay? Here, here, here we tried a little bit of fucking, you know, LSD or whatever around pot and that, but I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, like, that, shit sh that shit would slow you down. And the difference between there and now is back then, there was nothing wrong with, uh, having a buzz now and then, but if, if, if you were caught out to be a fucking junkie or anything, you'd fucking get kicked out or get a good fucking hiding. You know? Where, where today, it's, it's sad, but I, I, th I think they've just forgotten that. I, I, I talk about how I love the mom, I'll never leave and all that. Well, that most probably will be one thing that most probably would make me leave the mob if I, if I see it all turn into junkies. A mobster who is a drug addict is a risk to himself and others. He has the potential to become a police informant. But in Christchurch, it was the business of drugs that proved the mob's downfall. Being in the mob was never about making money, but that's what drugs bring, money and lots of it. And when money takes over, loyalty, honor, and respect can go out the window. And the next thing you know, you are a chapter in history. Part of New Zealand's biggest ever drug trial. 
Ross, historically, how big a problem have the mob been in Christchurch? Oh, they were a reasonable problem. They weren't as bad as some, but um, they become more prominent later on as we looked into them. In 2002, the Christchurch police organised a massive probe into the mongrel mob. The architect was Detective Sergeant Ross Tarafiti. The operation's code name was Crusade. The operation began basically as a result of inter-gang tensions within the Mongol mob. There was uh, leadership problems. They were fighting amongst themselves. Police were being called um, to gang members' addresses where other members were breaking in, smashing their way in, using baseball bats, stabbing their own members. Um, the whole gang was starting to fall apart. The New Zealand police's greatest problem is a drug called P. It's a pure form of methamphetamine. In Christchurch, they are doing all they can to stamp it out. Methamphetamine is bad news as far as the police are concerned because it alters people's behaviour, makes them quite violent. They just become very volatile. It's causing a lot of problems within the gang too because a lot of their members are dropping dead out of it. The police set up around-the-clock surveillance on the mob's pad. It was part of an operation that ran for 15 months. The Christchurch mob were selling drugs. Mostly cannabis, but also pee. They're quite brazen about the way they went about selling their drugs. They weren't exactly hiding it, were they? They don't, they don't care. That's what the whole attitude of the, the mar is. Uh, they just go out there and do their business. The police discovered that almost every patch member was involved in selling drugs from their premises. Members would be rostered with drug sales considered part of the routine duties. But the operation wasn't as profitable as it might have been. The funny thing about the whole operation was that they were in the business of selling cannabis and they were actually ripping each other off. Um, quite a few of the members would be um, using quite a bit of the product themselves without selling it and then telling other people that uh, for one reason or another that the money had gone. Police raids in the mob's HQ turned up guns, ammunition and further evidence of their extensive drug operation. The subsequent trial was one of the biggest in New Zealand's history. There were 18 mob members or associates in the dock. But Operation Crusade is the first time that that many members have been put away at the same time, is that correct? That's right. As far as I'm aware, we've never taken a whole chapter out in the one, one incident, and that's where it's made the damage in Christchurch, because they're all gone. Uh, other people will no doubt come in to fill some of the gap, but things have been pretty quiet as a result of this. The team's work sent key members of the mob to jail for up to nine years. The gang were thrown out of their pad, which was then razed to the ground. Drugs effectively wiped out the Christchurch mongrel mob. So in the end, what is there to say about the mongrel mob? Their record of violence, murder and mayhem is truly appalling. But when Dennis talks about loyalty, honour and respect, you can understand what he means. It is a paradox summed up in the strange side of Dennis, with all that he stands for, tending to the graves of his brothers. And looking back on it, that is the image that sticks in my mind. So there's about seven uh, mobsters in the cemetery here. Kevin was a bit of a comedian fella. But he just had enough of life and took his life. He need a good die, yeah? There's another guy buried over there, Monty, who was a good friend of yours, wasn't he? Mm, Monty Beefham, just over there, with the red scarf on. Yeah. What happened to him? Uh, he actually got run over. But he actually, <laughs> he actually got run over twice. And he got hit by a car. And when he stumbled across the other side of the road, he, he got hit by a bus. There's, there's no future without a passe, and, and, and a lot of people have forgotten now. 
our bros that have passed away, we're slowly forgetting everything. I just want to just want to bring that tightness back again, that brotherhood. On my journey, I'd been surprised to discover the pockets of savagery which exist in the middle of one of the safest, most civilized places on the planet. I discovered that the determined efforts of the authorities and the gang's own problems with the drug trade threaten their very existence. For somebody like Dennis, who has committed his life to the mongrel mob, this would be a tragedy. But would the rest of New Zealand shed a tear? I can tell this is for Michael. Your mother was giving me something that no one can take away from me, you know? Meet the fans who go the extra mile, Count Michael Jackson is next, and tomorrow at nine. The monarchy is in crisis. I'm Janet Street Porter, and I've got a plan. Janet saves the monarchy.